morning, church. Glad you could be here on campus today. Welcome all those who are tuning in on Facebook live stream. We're grateful for this opportunity to worship together. Uh, what a beautiful day God has given to us. Let's uh, ask God's blessing in a prayer to join our hearts together and celebrate his wonderful gifts. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and say thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the comfort you've given to so many this past week. Lord, we thank you for answered prayer. And now, Lord, as we gather together today, we ask for your blessing. All our expressions of worship might honor you and be a comfort and encouragement and a challenge to us all. We say thanks. In Jesus' wonderful name we ask. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, let's continue to worship and celebrate this wonderful opportunity. I invite you to stand together with us as we sing the song, I am a friend of God. And he calls us friends. Isn't it great to know in life it's really difficult that we can call God our friend and he's with us.
It actually used to be called uh, Tota, uh, which is Navajo for three rivers, because there, there are three rivers that meet here in Farmington. You have Native American cultures, you have Hispanic cultures, you have white culture, and all of them are, are blending together. Growing up, Navajo and Hispanic, I mean, the, the, these are my people. So it was always going to be, when I finished up my college and seminary education, to come back home and to do gospel work here. This is a forgotten area, it's a neglected area. The Navajos are forgotten people. Um, and so there are a lot of problems here, a lot of drug abuse, a, a lot of alcohol abuse. And, and you combine that with poor education, high literacy, broken homes, a lot of poverty, it really creates this perfect storm. So I got hired on 
at a high school here. Working in the schools has really given me a unique opportunity to share the gospel with a, with a variety of students as they, as they come into my office. They know that there's someone at the school who cares about them, who they trust, who they can go and talk to. And what that has done is with our youth group, it's predominantly these, these students coming from that context that want to know more and they're hungry for more. There has to be churches for these people. So when people give, it enables us to do ministry, to do ministry effectively. The Navajo people are just like any other people. There are people who have a proud, rich history, but there are people who need Jesus Christ. So we're here to spread the gospel, to give the good news to a forgotten people in a forgotten place.
you, praise team. What a blessing it is to worship. For those who are on campus today and those who are watching live stream, if you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn, find the great letter, the great St. Paul, Ephesians, and you'll find chapter 3. We'll begin reading with verse 1. While you're looking there, we began this year celebrating God's wonderful gifts. We've highlighted two so far. In January, we focused on God's wonderful gift of life. And then last month in February, we focused on God's wonderful gift of his love. And now, for this month, leading up to Easter, we're going to celebrate God's wonderful gift of language. All of us know and experience how difficult sometimes it is to communicate uh, with someone else who perhaps doesn't speak our language. And so we want to consider the wonderful gift that God has given to us of how to communicate with one another. I suppose we might think that uh, Adam and Eve, uh, what language did they speak? They obviously were able to communicate, but from there you might say it's been downhill while the number of languages has continued to multiply. When we think of the Old Testament, let me highlight some of the things, the way that God communicated to us as human beings. We know the wonderful story of Noah and how God blessed his family and saved him through the flood. And after the flood, God communicated an awesome way to Noah and his family by placing a rainbow in the sky. And even today when we see a rainbow, it's a wonderful reminder of how much God loves us and the promise that he made and communicated to Noah and his family. Then if you know the story of Abraham, how God called Abraham out and said he's going to create a, a nation and bless him and be a blessing to all the nations. And he challenged Abraham to look up in the sky and say to Abraham, your descendants are going to be as many as the stars that you can see in the sky. What an awesome thing. Now. We continue on thinking of how God communicated Isaiah. Perhaps a worship experience like we're enjoying today. God gave him a special vision. And Isaiah recorded for us that he saw the Lord high and holy and lifted up. And then he saw himself. And the separation that was between a holy God and sinful man. So God can choose to communicate any way he wants because he's God after all. But then we come to the New Testament. Let me point out some ways that God has communicated in the past. For example, Joseph, who was to become the earthly father of Jesus, he gave him a special dream and told him it would be okay and that he could go ahead and become the earthly father of Jesus. Peter, who uh, is one of the great leaders of early Christianity and a follower of Christ, he had a lot of pride and prejudice that God had to deal with, and so he communicated to Peter in a wonderful vision uh, at noon, and it changed Peter's life. Then Jesus gave his final instructions to the church, you and I, through what we call the Great Commission. God has chosen to privilege us to share the good news here at home and to the ends of the earth. And then, what a blessing. that God led people to make great inventions called the printing press. Now, let me uh, just take a left turn here for a moment. When I first came to the church, and this kind of relates to how long I've been here, and it's been a wonderful privilege, but... The way we copied our bulletins and things when I first came here is it was there was this machine and you put ink in it and there was a handle and then you prepared this thing called a stencil 
and you wrap this stencil around this drum, made sure you had enough ink, and then you turned the crank, and out came something you could read, but it would mush, you know, smudge and whatever, and it was called a, a mimeograph machine. <laughs> and how awesome it is, the technology today, how we can have wonderful, colorful bulletins. And uh, we can share the information. And so how awesome it is, the technology that God gives to us, for example, the Facebook live stream. I'm so grateful for all the ways that we can share and communicate. And so today we want to look at how God used a man. And if there ever was a question about does God have a sense of humor, he certainly does. And, and we can see that in all different stories throughout the Bible. But God chose a Jew, a Pharisee, who was an enemy of the cross, and he became a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God called this Jew, this Pharisee, to bring the good news to the Gentiles. And if you know anything about history, there was a time when the Jews... Uh, had such prejudice against any other people group, like the Samaritans, and anything, anyone who was not a, a Jew. And so it's kind of interesting, and that's what we want to look at today at, in Ephesians chapter 3, when we see the mystery of grace, how God chose someone so unlikely to minister to a group of people that were great enemies. And how God wants to work in and through our life to minister to do people, perhaps we would say, uh, is so unlikely. People who are not like us. People who have a different culture, who like different food, who live in different places around the world, who speak a different language. And yet God is honored and we're blessed and the good news goes out in a way that brings glory to God and communicates how much that God loves you. Ephesians chapter 3, if you have it, you will follow along and as we begin reading chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, you have heard, haven't you, about the administration of God's grace that he gave to me for you. The mystery was made known to me by the revelation as I have briefly written above, by reading this, you are able to understand my insight about the mystery of the Messiah. This was not made known to the people in other generations, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Do we realize the full impact of what Paul is writing? Of how there's a people group called the Jewish people, God's people of the Old Testament, where they came to believe that God only loved them, that they were a special people. And now God is opening up to say the gospel is for all people. And how that would uh, uh, this make the, the Jewish people so angry, so frustrated that why would God open the gospel, the good news to other people groups and so Paul refers to this and what God is doing as a mystery a mystery of grace now Paul experienced God's grace in his own life just like all of us want to come to a place in our life where God becomes personal to us. It's wonderful to hear what God is doing in someone else's life. It's awesome when we see uh, what God accomplishes in our family, our friends, our co-workers. But all of us want to come to a point in our own life, our own experience, where God becomes real through a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ become a follower 
of Christ helps us know the God of the universe, our creator. And so Paul experienced that. At one point, he was against, he was an enemy of the cross of Christianity. And God radically changed his life, as he will for everyone who opens their life and invite God's in. He forgives you of your sin. He helps you overcome the burden of your past. And with that, gives you an exciting future as God works in and through your life. And so Paul experienced that in a personal way. But secondly, God's grace is powerful. And only the working of God's grace could help a man like Paul change his attitude, his focus against a people group that he would have called his enemy. We think about people who, uh, you know, we might think of our enemy. And yet, God is the one, by the working of his grace, to help us change our focus, our attitude, to realize that God loves all people, the whole world, and that Jesus died for everyone, not just a privileged few. And so, this morning, as we think about and looking at what God did in Paul's life, I'm wondering if there's a people group, people who speak a different language, a different culture, that it's really hard for us to accept or to think good of. Only God can change our attitude and our focus about a people group and the language that they speak. Now, with that, Paul shares that there's a wonderful partnership that works God's grace. First, God to us changes our life. And then as he works through us, he joins us together. And this is a wonderful privilege we have as a church to gather together to pray for and encourage one another and to worship together like we're doing this morning. And how awesome it is as we see and hear what God is doing in and through our church, through other people's lives. It strengthens us. It encourages us. What a blessing when you and I are obedient to allow God to work in our life, to help us minister to people, perhaps as people are watching our life and say, wow, look what God is doing in and through your life, through your workplace, through your school, through your neighborhood. And this was Paul as he shared the mystery of God's grace. Now, the mystery deals with the question, why? Why doesn't God just snap his fingers? Why doesn't God just speak the word? Why doesn't God just think the thought and it would come to pass? But for whatever reason, that's the mystery. Why does God choose us? Fall filled, failure people who we stumble, struggle, why does God choose to work in and through us so that we might have the privilege to minister to others? Other people who are so unlikely. Paul saw it as a wonderful partnership because when God does this, changes people's hearts and lives, and then we minister to other people, unlikely people groups and friendships, God gets the glory, and it's a wonderful partnership. Now, still have your Bible open. Look at verse 7. Paul says, I was made a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Now, this grace was given to me. And notice here how Paul, he was an educated very strong personality. He was a Pharisee, and yet look how God has changed his attitude and his personality once he became a Christian. No longer was he high and mighty and prideful, but notice how he refers to himself right here. He says, grace was given to me the least of all the saints to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of the Messiah. And to shed light for all about the administration of 
the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. How can a person go from being high, prideful, an enemy to other people groups, and suddenly, as God works his grace in his life, changes him to where Paul saw himself as the least among the people, that no longer was he this, but God had changed him to this, the least among all the saints. What is it that God needs to do in our life this morning, in our family, in our church, that we would begin to see other people groups, and that God would give us the way to communicate his love to the most unlikely people groups. Now we're privileged that God chose our church to minister to people in some unusual ways. Years ago, God led our church to open a daycare center. And over the years, he's brought different people groups. We've had the privilege to invest and, and to share and to pray for those of different faiths, of uh, different language groups, and how God will be honored with the investment of sharing God's love and ministry. Years ago, we were privileged to begin a deaf ministry. And uh, I can tell you how difficult it is, and, and many of you know, communicating not with your voice, but with your hands. And from time to time, you'll look over here and see these hands flying. <laughs> there you go. Trying to communicate the wonderful love of God in lots of other ways that God has privileged our church to minister to those who are different than us, who speak a different language, who enjoy a different culture. Now, Apostle Paul had a radical change in his life. And I wonder, as we face this year, what is it that God needs to do in your life and mine to change the way we think or interact with those who are a different people group, a different language? And Paul had come to an unbelievable change in his life. God had changed his whole focus and given him a love for a people group that once were his enemies. And in that, it changed the way he saw himself as the way he saw others. And so with that, I wonder what God needs to do in, in our life, in our family, our church, so that we can show God's love and communicate the light that comes from knowing God through the gospel. Well, still have your Bible open? Look at verse number 10. All this is said, this is so that God, in his multifaceted wisdom, may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. And this is according to the purpose of the ages, which he made in Messiah, Jesus our Lord, in whom we have. Now notice what God gives to us when we open our lives and welcome him. This is the wonderful ministry God has given to all of us as Christians, as families, as a church. He lists three wonderful things. I call it the church on fire, the people of faith. Notice what he says. Who he has given us boldness, access, and confidence through faith in him. So then I ask you, don't be discouraged over my affliction on your behalf, for they are for your glory. How do we respond to rejection, trouble in our life, to suffering? Most likely when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, he was in a Roman prison. Had every reason to be discouraged. After all, he was committed to serve the Lord, and yet he ends up in prison. But this gave him a tremendous opportunity. And so he writes this letter to encourage the people, the church in Ephesus and the surrounding believers. And with that, 
God began to do some incredible things of changing hearts and minds. And that's what grace is all about. Think with me this morning first about your own life. What could God do if you would allow him that opportunity? And secondly, what influence, as God works in your life, would it affect your family? And third, what exciting things could God do in our church if we were open to say, Lord, what is it that you desire of us? As we pray, as we give, as we serve, let's be ready for God to do some wonderful things in our life. But he's waiting for the opportunity. God will not sneak in. God won't beat you over the head. He won't make you do what he's waiting for is an opportunity. Will you join me this morning in giving God an opportunity to do something wonderful, awesome in your life? Perhaps to change the way you think about certain people groups or certain cultures? Would you join me in thinking about the influence that you and I can have on our families? And with that, what kind of church will we become this year? God chooses and gives us the privilege and opportunity. All the different people groups, the latest, there's 20-some people groups or more listed here in Sterling Heights alone. What is it that God would desire of us as his people group to share God's love in the light of the gospel? As your pastor, I want to be that kind of leader. Like Paul, open my heart and life and let God do something wonderful in my own life as we would lead the church and encourage what God would do this year. God loves us too much to leave us where we are this morning. He wants us to grow, mature, and to honor him. Will you join me in giving God an opportunity this morning? In a moment, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I wonder in that prayer, if you'd be so bold to open your heart and life, give God opportunity to do something in your heart and life today. And with that, you can be a wonderful influence on your family. And ultimately, God can transform our church in some wonderful ways. What is it? I can tell you this. I don't want to repeat 2020. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> no. 2020 is done and gone. And we look ahead to 2021. What awesome things. Things are going to open up. Things are going to get better. We'll be able to travel. We'll be able to minister. We'll be able to do some awesome things. Will we be ready? Let's stop here and pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and thank you for the wonderful blessing of your grace that we can communicate to others your love. And Lord, now I pray for each of us as individuals that we would open our hearts and minds right now. And Lord, I invite you to do something special. Lord, you maybe change our focus, change our attitude, change the way that we look at other people groups. And then, Lord, that you might use us to be a good influence on our families and friends. And Lord, I pray for our church that you would count us worthy as we give, as we minister to others, and Lord, as we have an opportunity to carry the gospel around the world. Lord, help us to be an obedient people for all that you ask of us. In Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Worship team is going to come and get ready. Lead us in a song of opportunity for those who are on campus. I'll be here in the front during this song. If you'd like to come and visit with me, sit with me, I'll pray and encourage you.
Ask God's blessing on you and the decision that you're making. For those who are watching live stream, this is an opportunity for you to respond as well. I pray that you give God an opportunity to do something special in your life, that you could influence your family, and ultimately that God would work in and through you and join us together here at the church to shine his light, to show his love here and now and throughout the world. Let's give God this opportunity to respond to him. I invite you to stand together with us as we sing some of the other words will be on the screen. <laughs>
thank you for your support, and I pray that you'll continue to give. What a blessing it's been to enjoy. Uh, you have taken very good care of my family and uh, our church, and so thank you so much for your giving. But uh, give us an opportunity to pray for you as well. And so find one of these in the back of your chair and uh, give it to me as you leave or uh, put it in the offering box. And we'll be glad to get you on the prayer list and pray for you. So enjoy this song. Use as an opportunity to just be encouraging comfort. And God bless you for worshiping today.